CBS World News, 9 a.m. Eastern Wartime, Douglas Edwards reporting. Here are the last-minute details of the Allied invasion of northern France. Allied air reconnaissance flyers have returned from the scene of the battle which began along the northern French coastline early this morning to report that several beachheads have now been established. Allied forces are slashing their way inland from these beachheads, according to the reconnaissance photos. At the same time, Allied parachute troops dropped behind the enemy lines last night are disrupting enemy defense systems and waiting to join forces with the troops pouring ashore on the beaches. Prime Minister Churchill told Commons that more than 4,000 ships, together with many thousand smaller craft, are transporting the invasion force across the channel. Churchill declared that the invasion is proceeding, and we quote, according to a plan, and what a plan. At Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force, it's reported that German destroyers and e-boats are rushing into the operational area off the northern coast of France, and no doubt are being dealt with by the Allies. Incidentally, the initials of these headquarters are S-H-A-E-F, and you're going to get mighty familiar with them. An Allied military commentator at S-H-A-E-F declared this morning that H-R for the invasion ranged from 6 to 8 a.m. European time. Another report from that same source reveals that American battleships are supporting the Allied landings, with United States Coast Guard units also participating in the operations. In a blasting foremast to the invasion, the British Bomber Command sent more than 1,300 of its heaviest bombers roaring across the channel last night and this morning for a saturation attack on the invasion areas. And now here are some last-minute bulletins. Allied troops have landed on the Channel Islands of Guernsey and Jersey, according to a German broadcast. The same enemy source says Allied tanks have landed midway between Cherbourg and Le Havre, but that the greatest concentrations of landing craft have been observed off the two ports themselves. Earlier enemy broadcasts said Caen was the focal point of the entire attack and that the drive inland is aimed at the city of Paris. And just a few moments ago, this news came from Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Forces. Casualties among Allied airborne troops on France have been light. We repeat that from Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Forces. Casualties among Allied airborne troops on France have been light. Just four hours before the German radio began its announcements of the Allied invasion, President Roosevelt told the world that the fall of Rome came at an opportune time when Allied forces were poised across the channel for Western Europe. And at the same time, at the end of his speech, the President uttered a prayer for our invasion troops. Said Mr. Roosevelt, May God bless them and watch over them and over all of our gallant fighting men. And shortly after his commander-in-chief had spoken, General Dwight Eisenhower, Supreme Commander, went on the air himself to broadcast a message to the people of Western Europe. Said the invasion commander, People of Western Europe, a landing was made this morning on the coast of France by troops of the Allied Expeditionary Force. This landing is part of the concerted United Nations plan for the liberation of Europe made in conjunction with four great Russian allies. And although the initial assault may not have been made in your country, the hour of your liberation is approaching. Then General Eisenhower went on to give his orders to the patriots and underground armies of Europe. He warned them not to attempt preliminary uprisings, but to await his orders so that they could act at the most effective moment. Said he, prompt and willing obedience to the orders that I shall issue is essential. And then General Eisenhower, who has been entrusted with the problem of a French provisional government, said this, effective civil administration of France must be provided by Frenchmen. Those who have common cause with the enemy and so betrayed their country will be removed. As France is liberated from her oppressors, you yourselves will choose your representatives and the government under which you wish to live. And then the American commander of the invasion forces made this plea. Great battles lie ahead. I call upon all of you who love freedom to stand with us. Keep your faith staunch. Our arms are resolute, and together we shall achieve victory. And now here are some of the various eyewitness reports which have been coming in from various correspondents in Great Britain. CBS correspondent Richard Hottlett, speaking from London, told of the instant that was literally the last second of invasion preparation and the first second of actual invasion. Said he, the Allied forces landed in France early this morning. I watched the first landing barges hit the beach exactly on the minute of H hour. I was in a 9th Air Force marauder flying at 4,500 feet along 20 miles of the invasion coast. And Columbia correspondent Hottlett continued, From all I could see during those first few minutes, there was nothing stopping the assault parties from getting ashore. Except for some light flak, we saw no enemy gunfire. The only signs of life in enemy territory were some white and yellow parachutes dotting the ground where our paratroopers had landed. The weather is favorable for the operation. 
Autolith's eyewitness account added that Allied warships were standing offshore bombarding the enemy coast, apparently without opposition, and the Luftwaffe was also conspicuous by its absence. The CBS correspondent also recounted that special care was taken to prevent a recurrence of the previous tragic accidents in which Allied ships fired on their own air support. He reveals that overnight, every single bomber and fighter had been painted with special markings on wings and fuselage. And here, word for word, is CBS correspondent Hotelet's description of the scene off the French coast on D-Day shortly before H hour. By this time, it was getting on, and the sun was painting the sky a bright orange color on our left. Below us, the English Channel was a fine, deep blue. There were a few white caps, but the impression was that it wasn't very rough down below. About five miles off the French coast, we saw planes in a steep dive laying a smoke screen. Just about the same minute the pilot saw, said he saw the fires on the shore. I looked hard as I could, and there, down to the left, were some naval vessels. They looked like cruisers firing broadsides onto the shore. Near the cruisers were dozens of landing craft of all kinds hardly visible in the early morning haze. All this while we saw medium bombers and fighters crisscrossing on the way to the targets without a sign of a German plane. And then we turned to over the coast about ten miles, and ten minutes before H hour, we saw a fast assault boat race along parallel to the beach, laying a smoke screen. From the way the screen lay, smooth and even, it looked as if there were no wind. And Hottel had concluded... The circumstances of our flight make it impossible to draw any far-reaching conclusions on how the battle is going, but one thing we can say already, and that is, our air supremacy over the coastal invasion zone is not seriously challenged. Correspondent Herbert M. Clark, speaking over a pooled network of all major United States radio chains, spoke in praise of Allied security measures. He said, the place we've picked for our main landing is one Jerry hadn't figured on. The Nazis have been badly outguessed on this whole show. It's going to be surprised by the direction of the attack, and he's going to get a shock from the timing. The master race has fallen down again. Another Allied correspondent heard on Columbia this morning was James Willard, also speaking for the pooled networks. Willard declared that thousands of Allied planes had been at work all night, softening up the invasion coast. Said Willard, already several thousand paratroopers are waiting further inland to join forces with the landing parties. These airborne troops were flown in last night. Willard also commented on the amazing quietness of the scene along the strip of territory directly behind the invasion beaches. He declared that with the exception of a German tank moving up the road toward the beachhead or hiding in hedges, he could see no sign of enemy resistance. As to those Allied paratroopers now disrupting German defenses behind the front, Allied correspondent Wright Bryan, who accompanied them on their flight, says they met only scattered small arms fire from the fields. Brian has been living with a unit of paratroopers for some time. He reports that yesterday afternoon, General Eisenhower visited the camp, passing quietly among the men and chatting with them. Brian says the men were trained to the utmost and fully ready for action. And here is his description of what happened in his plane as it flew over France. The senior officer on board moved quietly up and down the passenger compartment, speaking to each man and asking if he had everything he needed. As the men settled back into their seats, Colonel Cole said... There's a doc who's going to give you some pills to guard against air sickness. Make yourselves as comfortable as you can, and you'd better try to sleep a little. And then quiet settled over the plane. These men had done their talking. Now they were grim and silent. Later on, correspondent Brian said, I walked down the long passenger cabin to see how the paratroopers were riding. More than half of them had taken their colonel's advice and were dozing with their heads back against the wall and their feet stretched out in front of them. The others were sitting silently, except for two or three who talked among themselves in whispers. And a broadcast an hour ago from somewhere on the English coast, in it, another reporter for the radio pool, Stanley Richardson, gave an eyewitness account of the naval action that prepared the way for the landings. As far as the naval phase of our activity was concerned, he said, not a shot was exchanged with the enemy while I was on the scene. And for that preliminary phase of the show, at least, it was all too incredibly easy. We left our patrol torpedo boat in daylight to accompany the slower-moving light advance guard of ships which had to pave the way for the actual landings. One of our missions was to protect the Allied minesweepers which cleared a wide channel straight to the enemy shore for our troops, transports, and supply ships. Long lines of ships of every description were discernible on the skyline, literally miles of craft in every, even columns converging upon the area and the channel marked for the concentration points for the actual invasion. Huge transports, tank landing ships, small troop landing craft, tankers and supply vessels of every kind 
plodded doggedly along under lowering skies in laboring over heavy seas. You people at home would have been thrilled to the bone to see all these American men, American ships, and American supplies sailing calmly into the action for which they had been prepared and trained for so many months. By nightfall, we were nearing the French coast, and the watch tightened. But nothing happened, even when a full, pale moon appearing fitfully from behind the clouds gave our position away, clearly to any enemy who had been laying in wait for us. And then the fast and heavy combat ships moved up into position. All aligned themselves in the bombardment area to loose a hail of high explosives to protect the troops moving to the beaches on their landing craft. The warships started laying their smoke screen preparatory to shooting their guns. It was then only, and only a few minutes of HR, of the long-awaited D-Day. And now here's a picture on this side of the ocean. The Associated Press put a bulletin on the wires at 12.37 a.m. this morning, Eastern Wartime, saying the Germans had announced invasion landings on the French coast. Instantly, the CBS newsroom in New York sprang into action and mobilized a full invasion staff according to plan. CBS news analyst Ned Calmer put the bulletin on the air at about 12.48, underlining the fact that it was an unconfirmed enemy statement. In both the CBS shortwave listening post and newsroom, our specialists began to monitor foreign broadcasts. At frequent intervals, CBS announcers and CBS military analyst Major George Fielding Elliott broadcast the continuing German reports, always emphasizing that it was still an enemy report unconfirmed by Allied sources. And then at a little after 3.30 this morning, we switched to SHEAF in London, where Colonel Dupuy read the first official Allied communique. One of the most interesting parts of any great story like this invasion is the way people around the world react to the first news. CBS correspondent Charles Shaw reported from London earlier this morning that he practically was town crier for the city of London, which was largely unaware in the early morning that the invasion had begun. Shaw rode through the London streets asking people what they thought of the news and found most of them hadn't heard it. But the answer of one girl when she heard the news from Shaw was typical. She said simply, thank God. And far removed from the thankful and hopeful spirit in Allied capitals is the only reaction so far noted from the Tokyo radio, which broadcast its first first mention of the invasion, in a German language piece beamed toward Europe. The Jap broadcast said, We have just learned with deep concern of the landings by the Allies on the coast of France. We expect they will be quickly annihilated by the courageous German army. That from Tokyo. That's the way the Japanese put it. Up to now, there's been no mention of the landings to the Japanese people themselves, according to the United States government monitors monitors of the Office of War Information. Our correspondent, William J. Dunn, reported from Australia that uh, invasion reports have the right-of-way on Australian radios and in the Australian headlines, but he added that there is not much external excitement. Here in our own country, reaction from coast to coast was similar. People kept on working at overnight shifts in shipyards and other factories and went to work as usual this morning. But everyone seems to be more serious and many stopped in their tasks long enough to offer prayers for the success of the Allied effort. Perhaps most dramatic of all was the ringing of the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia's Independence Hall. The ancient bell was struck six times as Philadelphia's Mayor Bernard Samuel read the famous inscription, Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. Well, German propagandists, asserted today that despite the invasion of Western Europe, life continued normal in Berlin with no excitement, no additions, no special radio announcements. But a part of these assertions, obviously, were rather false. From the time of the first landings, a constant stream of broadcasts came from the German transmitters, many of them carrying more than an indication that Hitler's defenses along the western coast had been caught napping. The German press chief was quoted by DNB as saying the Allies opened the invasion on the order of Moscow. A DNB correspondent asserted the German people is longing for revenge because of the Allied bombings of their cities. The German news agency Transocean contended in early broadcasts that it was not certain of Allied intentions, but at 1 p.m. it said, this much has become clear by midday. These Allied landings mean this is the great invasion, and no fooling. That's the story from Germany. Ladies and gentlemen, Colombia will continue its invasion coverage in approximately 30 seconds from now. We're pausing at this time. This is Douglas Edwards speaking, and this is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Columbia's news headquarters in New York, Bob Trout speaking again. In a few moments, we hope again to bring you another broadcast from 
Britain, probably from Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Forces. At that time, we hope to hear from several of our Columbia correspondents. We don't know exactly at what time we'll make the switch, but uh, in a few moments, I expect that uh, I will hear that it is time to switch to London. The warning will probably come very quickly, as you undoubtedly know, if you've been with us for several hours during last night and this morning, you know how quickly the warning comes that London is ready. Meanwhile, uh, in case you've been... uh, if in case you got up, let's say, a bit late and you've been filling yourself in on the invasion, you know that the German reports were the first reports, and uh, we had two or three hours in the small hours last night before the Allied uh, Supreme Headquarters in Britain announced that the invasion had begun when all the news was coming from the German radio. It wasn't very much news, but it did say that the invasion had begun, and that turned out to be right. And so Elmer Davis who, like most of us, rushed to his office in the middle of the night last night. Elmer Davis has, this morning, given a warning about this German radio propaganda. Mr. Davis says that despite the German accuracy in announcing the invasion before the official Allied communique came in from Supreme Headquarters in Britain, German broadcasts should not be relied on in the future. Elmer Davis said the reason the Germans made the announcement was possibly that they're trying to build up a reputation for accuracy so that they can put one over, he said, on the Allies later. And Elmer Davis asked Americans to remember that Joseph Goebbels is in business for his health and not for ours. Another brief dispatch from Supreme Headquarters just come in, just been handed me. It says, Allied Air Forces threw 11,000 aircraft of almost every type into the grand invasion of Europe today, bombing and strafing miles of Normandy's beaches and flying inland to break the enemy's communications. That's the latest detail that has come from the Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force, that the Air Force is through 11,000 aircraft of almost every type into the battle. And now it is time to go again to Britain for another broadcast, so back to London for a special broadcast by Columbia's correspondent, Charles Shaw. Go ahead, London. Go ahead, CBS. Go ahead, CBS. This is the first recording received from CBS correspondent Charles Collingwood, who was on an LST with the invasion forces. Well, now we're up here on the the deck, on the main deck of the LST, which is crowded and packed with vehicles of every sort. The trucks are full. Just reading uh, the names on the boxes of some of them, here's one that says cartridges, and another one says hand grenades, and there are all the bags and bed rolls in which these men are going to sleep. I wonder what these soldiers feel like. I mean, here they are aboard the LST, their last link with a peaceful lock. They're just as sealed here as though they had severed every connection with the outside world. I wonder what they're thinking about. I wonder what they feel about everything that's going to come. Let's ask one of them. Hey, soldier, come over here, will you? Yes. What's your name? Uh, Staff Sergeant Alexander Hant. Alexander Hant. Where do you come from, Alex? I'm from Chicago, Illinois. From Chicago, huh? Yes. What do you feel about this thing now that you're on? Well, sir, I feel a lot better since uh, we're on the assessment here, because it seems like we're doing more good than we was on the last one. Uh, what was the last one? It was an LST. So that was one of the maneuvers, was it? Yes, sir, it was. Maneuver. Is this one any different than that one? Uh, yes, it is. It seems like we have a lot more equipment than we did have the last time. More guns, I suppose. Yes. Do you think this is going to be the real thing this time? Well, I really can't say. You think so? I don't know. <laughs> Does it worry you? No, it doesn't worry me any. You aren't scared? No. You're all set? Yes. Well, that's fine, Staff Sergeant Ham. These kids are certainly security conscious because there's no chance of any leakage from the ship as it is at the moment, but that one wasn't telling us anything. I wonder whether they really do know uh, what sort of an operation they're going on that it really is the real thing. There's a captain coming along here. I'll ask him. Captain, do you have a minute? Can I see you? Yes, sure. Hey. <laughs> What's your name, by the way? Uh, captain Wood. Captain Wood? Well, I was just talking to one of your men, Captain. And, uh... You know what? 
officers are security minded also, probably even more so than the men. Well, what sort of a briefing have you had then, Captain, or don't you want to tell us? Well, all I can say is I've had a briefing on this exercise. <laughs> all right, that's fine. Well, what, how, how, what sort of shape do you think the men are that uh, you got along with you? They had a lot of training. Well, as far as I can see, or from what I have seen of the men, I think they're well capable of doing any job that the exercise may demand. That is correct. Is that right? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Putting words in my mouth. <laughs> how did how did the loading go on the ship here, from your point of view? Uh, the loading on the ship uh, seems to have gone without any any bit of trouble whatsoever. It well, certainly looked smooth from where we were down below watching it. Everything came came over very quickly. Seems well organized. Yeah, that's the army for you, you know. <laughs> well, how are, how are they settling down here on board? Everybody comfortable, and, uh, or as comfortable as they can be? Uh, yes, they are. The men seem to have been on uh, these boats before. We sit like down now, as Captain Wood said. And the trucks are all on. The soldiers are all on. And there are other LSTs in the same condition as this one, with soldiers lining the rails and with trucks full of equipment, both inside on the tank deck and up on the main deck, which is where we're standing now on our ship. The LSC-48 is just beginning to get underway. We're pushing away from the hard, away from the shore where we're loaded, and we're going back to our anchorage where we will stay until we set off on this coming expedition. Our last link with the land has been cut. I return you now to the United States. We're now back at Columbia's news headquarters in uh, New York City. We've just heard a broadcast from London, Columbia's correspondent Charles Collingwood, a recording, I should say, of Columbia's correspondent Charles Collingwood, who was aboard a landing ship tank before leaving the British coast and was interviewing the men who were loaded in as they started off for the invasion. A few late dispatches have just come in. The Paris radio today has broadcast an appeal by Marshal Pétain to Frenchmen to refrain from actions which would call down upon you, he said, tragic reprisals. In other words, he does not want Frenchmen to help the Allies in their task of liberating the continent. Marshal Pétain said France has become a battlefield. The circumstances of battle, he said, may compel the German army to take special measures in the battle area, so Frenchmen accept this necessity. And then Marshal Pétain called upon French officials, railwaymen, and workers to remain at their posts where they would serve the German military machine in order to keep the life of the French nation and in order to carry out their tasks. Marshal Pétain told Frenchmen, do not listen to outside voices calling upon you not to listen to our decrees. And that is the statement of the Vichy Marshal Pétain upon the beginning of the Allied task of liberating the continent. A few words of Swiss reaction have just come in. The words, the Allies have landed in Normandy, swept through the city of Geneva like wildfire this morning, a Swiss newspaper tells us in a dispatch reported to the Office of War Information. The people in Geneva forgot their usual stoicism, rushed out into the streets to be the first to pass on the tidings. The newspaper said, No one said good morning today. Everywhere it was only, Did you hear? They have landed. They have landed. No one asks, How are you? But cries instead, It has come. In Geneva, the news flash burst from the radios and seized each person as if he had been shaken by the shoulder. In every public square, gesticulating groups gather who can talk of nothing else. That's a description of how the news was received in the Swiss city of Geneva, reported in a dispatch which is sent on to us by the OWI. You'll be interested to know that there was no mention of the invasion in this morning's German newspapers, according to a survey of German papers made by the German DNB agency reported by United States government monitors. That's particularly interesting because, as you know, it was the Germans who started to cry invasion and who spread the word outside Germany, not inside Germany, spread the word outside Germany even before Supreme Headquarters in Great Britain could put out the first communique. Here at Columbia's World News Headquarters, uh, we are at the moment 
trying to arrange a two-way transatlantic conversation between one of our correspondents in London, Charles Shaw, and Paul White, the director of news broadcasts. We uh, did this once before, earlier in the morning, or perhaps I should say last night, and we broadcast it for you so that you could get a little insight into one phase of this news business of covering the invasion. And I uh, rather hesitate to start into some long dispatch here at the moment because we're still trying to get this two-way conversation arranged. And, of course, if we do, we'll just have to uh, drop everything at the moment that it comes through, and then we'll present it to you. However, here is a United Press dispatch from an American fighter base in England. It tells us that Thunderbolt pilots returned from the invasion area today and reported that Allied troops were piling onto the shore of France, apparently with little opposition and that the skies had been virtually cleared of German planes. The fighter pilots who came back to the American fighter base in England said, one of them said, from 4,000 feet I could see trucks and jeeps all over the beach and more coming. One truck blew up, but that was the only sign of enemy activity. And now... We have arranged this two-way broadcast between Charles Shaw and Paul White, the director of Columbia's News Broadcast. We're going to bring the CBS network in on this conversation, so here is Paul White. Hello, Charlie Shaw. Hello, Charlie Shaw. Hello, Paul White. Uh, That was fine, that Collingwood recording that we heard a little while ago. That was the first one to go out from here. We wondered about uh, how it sounded. Sounded fine. That's now, fine. Uh, what else do you have coming up that you know of today? Well, we know, of course, about the King's broadcast, uh, King George. That ought to reach, that'll reach you at 3 p.m. your time. And, of course, we have a regular World Today broadcast, which will reach you at 6.45 New York time. And then uh, any time we get news, of course, we're going to call you for a circuit and uh, ask you to uh, give us the means of uh, transmitting it. We expect... Quite a bit of news, and as you can imagine, why we've all been pretty busy here today. Uh, There was some evidence of busyness at this end, too, Charlie. Uh, We'll uh, we'll continue to monitor London all day long, and whenever you have anything, call us in. Well, we suggest you do that, and we hope to have plenty for you. All right. Now, could you tell us anything about where our various staff men are? Well, yes. uh, They're all uh, very busy. Larry Lesseur is out with the American ground forces overseas, of course. Bill Down is with the British ground forces. And Charles Collingwood, as you know from the previous broadcast, is with the Navy. And so is our correspondent Bill Shadell with the Navy, along with our naval technician, Gene Ryder. And then Dick Hoddleett, as you've heard from broadcast earlier today, Uh, has been out with the marauders of the 9th Air Force. He uh, watched part of the invasion uh, from the air. And Ed Murrow, our chief, has been rushing around here just about as busy as the old one-armed paper hanger, you know. And uh, so we're all pretty well assigned at the moment. Uh, That's that's fine, Charlie. Uh, One thing I heard from you in a previous uh, broadcast, I'm going to get off this microphone myself and let you give the public some news. I thought that the public might be interested and how we were lining up these broadcasts. But I understood from you previously that you had been uh, out around London in the early hours, and I wonder if you'd mind telling us about it again. Well, yes, Paul. I, uh, as soon as this communique was broadcast uh, from the studios down here, I decided to get into a taxi cab and do a little bit of walking around to uh, see how London was taking uh, this thing. And as I said on this uh, previous broadcast of mine, for about an hour after the broadcast of this communique number one, I actually played town crier to a London which was generally unaware that uh, France had been invaded. I got in this cab, and and I walked the road and walked uh, through the Strand and Fleet Street and past St. Paul's and along the Thames Embankment to the Houses of Parliament and to Westminster Abbey and Piccadilly Circus and other parts of what you might call downtown London, asking people here and there what they thought of the news. And in most cases, I found out that I had to report the news before I got any comment from them. In fact, it looked like London just about any morning between 9.30 and 10.30. The streets were comparatively deserted. Soldiers of all the nations were ambling about, although not in great numbers. And the street cleaners were running their brushes along the curb. I asked this taxi driver to take me around the city because I wanted to see how the people were reacting to the news. I said, "Uh, incidentally, have you heard the news? He said, I heard something about it, but I don't know whether it's official or not. Well, I assured him that this time it was. 
because I had just returned from the studio where the communique was broadcast. We were waiting for a traffic light at one time, and we drew alongside a car which was driven by a girl wearing the uniform of France. I leaned out and I said to her, what do you think of the news? And she said, what news? And I said, the Allies have landed in France. And all she could say was, thank God. Well, Fleet Street, the headquarters of the press in London, was just about normal. Saw a couple of men who might have been reporters dashing into buildings. And I went up to St. Paul's Cathedral to see whether there were any worshippers inside. And the only person in that big auditorium was a black-robed guy to the crook who hadn't heard the news himself. So I told him about it, and he said, that's good. And that Paul was just about the way it was all over London. I went down to Westminster Abbey. There were two RAF sergeants there sightseeing past the Houses of Parliament. A couple of women were trying unsuccessfully to gain entrance. And uh, went past Downing Street and up Downing Street, and it was empty, except for a street cleaner almost in front of number 10. That's the Prime Minister's home, you know. And uh, all over London today, women were selling flags for the benefit of the Red Cross. I went up to a girl to buy a flag, and she hadn't heard the news either. And when I did tell her the news, why, her expression changed very little. The best interviewee I had was a roly-poly woman who was just about as broad as she was long. She had heard the broadcast. Apparently a foreigner, because she said it's good. Incidentally, in contrast with what I imagine is happening in New York, there wasn't a newspaper extra on the streets. So, Paul, I would say that London this morning, for at least an hour after the broadcast of Communique Number 1, was just about the same London that it was yesterday morning. Uh, that's fine, Charlie. Thank you for the report. And we'll be listening in from now on on the London circuits to... Uh... Uh, hear anything that you have and put it on the network as soon as it comes in. Well, thank and, you, Paul. Uh, now we'll, uh, I hope that you'll be hearing from us soon. Okay, fine. And now we'll let uh, Bob Trout uh, continue with this program. That was a two-way conversation between Paul White, Columbia's director of news broadcasts, here at our news headquarters in New York, and one of Columbia's correspondents in Great Britain, Charles Shaw. We brought you the conversation to give you an idea of how one phase of this business of covering an invasion is handled here at the uh, Columbia's New York News Headquarters. And now we're going to go to Washington again to hear once more from Columbia's correspondent, Joe McCaffrey, who is stationed at the headquarters of the War Department in Washington, the Pentagon Building. So we take you now to Washington, Joe McCaffrey reporting. Informed military men here at the Pentagon building, informed in basic military tactics, but not on the actual plans for D-Day, are pondering the idea that the landings in France by Allied forces may be only the old prize fighters' movement. It is old, time-proven strategy to hit them where they ain't, and the Allies may have had that in mind when they launched their initial landings. However, these military men, in informal conversations, point out that the Germans may have the same hunch and are holding their huge reserve forces in readiness for a second and more solid blow by the Allies. The Allies, as one former sports writer put it, may be pivoting on one foot, waiting to see if the Germans withdraw heavily from other sectors of the coastline, and if they do, then they will hit those sectors. These men, who study the art of battle, point out that should the Germans play a waiting game, the Allies may plunge ahead with full forces on the sector already in the combat zone. But this, please remember, is only theory as offered during informal talks with men who make war their business. Officers who have talked with German prisoners relate that they have every confidence in the Nazi troops being able to repel any Allied blows of the continent. The prisoners are arrogant about the fact that their forces are much superior to ours and that we will be hurled back into the sea with ease. Then, say these prisoners, Germany is supreme. For never within the next decade could the Allied power raise a force so huge as with which he has tried to invade the continent. Now let, let us look at that situation in reverse, say these army officers. All the German hope is apparently stacked in the cards that the Nazi troops will make quick work of the Allies. But a successful landing and establishment of key beachheads would be the beginning of a general letdown among not only the German soldier, but the man and woman at home in Germany. They will see their dreams slowly but steadily disappearing in the smoke of the bitterly fought battle. The Pentagon men ponder, too, what effect the D-Day will have on the German troops in Italy 
now doing battle with Gen Lieutenant General Mark Clark's Fifth Army. Although it may be some time before they hear the news, they will learn of it in time. And when that time comes, they will realize the reinforcements for which they have been praying will be long, long delayed if they ever come. And what of the Italian campaign, wonder these men in the heart of the War Department? Will that campaign degenerate now into a holding action? For, they point out, the Alps are in the way. Only Hannibal crossed that natural barrier, and he had his elephants. Our troops in Italy, it is emphasized, are now seasoned fighting men. Should the line be held in Italy, and there is no reason that the Germans would try to come back into lower Italy with their supply lines so shattered, these men from the 5th Army might be used to good advantage in the invasion. The troops in the invasion are, for the most part, green men, but they have been seasoned by hard, rigorous training. The fall of Rome yesterday was viewed in a new light by these hard-bitten observers as they reviewed the effect that it would have on the occupied countries. The treatment of the Italian people in and around Rome will be heard of, if not immediately via the powerful Allied short wave sets, eventually, and its effect on the peoples of France should bring strong support to our side. Army men, familiar with France, and many with a clear knowledge of the famed French underground, predict that, aided by the bulletins recently issued from General Eisenhower's command, these people will give invaluable aid to the Allies. All the military men that I have talked to here are agreed that we face a tough, stubborn fight, and this is really it. Every shot counts, and every man means that Europe is nearer liberation. We return you now to CBS Washington Newsroom, Bill Henry reporting. Official Washington, as might be expected, has been right on top of the invasion news ever since the German radio made the first announcement shortly after midnight, Eastern wartime. The Pentagon, the Navy building, and even the White House were all lit up like Times Square during the early morning hours. As soon as the official communique came through from General Eisenhower, officers handed out carefully prepared mimeograph statements, including one from General Black Jack Pershing, who led our forces in France in World War I. The chiefs of staff, the men responsible for our whole war effort, were on the job in the early morning hours, as were the British representatives on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Great as the invasion is, it's still only a part of the great world war for which these men are responsible. Secretary Stimson demonstrated his confidence about the invasion by remaining at home in the early morning hours of the battle for Europe. General Marshall, however, stayed at his desk the greater part of the night. Sometime before dawn, he left the Pentagon. Within five minutes after the first communique came from London... The OWI, through its shortwave transmitters in New York and San Francisco, was telling the world in 39 languages and dialects that the liberation of Europe was underway. There's been no opportunity as yet to get very much information out of Congress, as the congressmen are only just assembling now, and uh, Congress takes up at noon. That was quite early. Columbia sent people around to talk to some of the boys on the street, just as Charles Shaw was on the strand to talk to people in London. However, in spite of all that, there were other things, other happenings here. For instance, President Roosevelt went to bed last night before the news of the invasion was released, and even though he doubtless was aware of the imminence of the invasion, he slept peacefully through it and was not awakened. White House attaches, however, prepared a summary of the dispatches for him, and he's expected to discuss the invasion at his news conference this afternoon. And a colored man delivering ice at the White House this morning said, I guess they'll be needing this today, all right. I return you now to Bob Trout in New York. Since we went to Washington, we've had another bulletin from London here at our Columbia News headquarters in New York. The German news agency, DNB, has acknowledged a few minutes ago that Allied tanks have penetrated several miles between the towns of Caen, C-A-E-N, and Isigny, on the Normandy Peninsula. DNB, the German news agency, acknowledges the penetration of a few miles by Allied tanks on the Normandy Peninsula. And now, once again, we're going to hear from Columbia's military analyst, Major George Fielding Elliott, who wants to tell us something of the background of naval support which our troops are receiving in the invasion. Here's Major Elliott. Uh, you heard in uh, broadcasts earlier uh, in the day the... Uh uh, bulletins uh, announcing the 
Uh, it's more than 640 naval guns, ranging from 4 to 16 inches in size, are bombarding the beaches and enemy strong points in support of our landing forces, and also of the work of our mine-sweeping force. These two forms of naval support are very important to a landing operation. And uh, the minesweepers perhaps uh, are even more important than the naval gunfire because these minesweepers must get the deadly mines out of the way in order that the landing craft may approach the shore. Some mines are what are called moored mines. That is, they're mines which are uh, moored to the bottom, uh, to uh, heavy anchors resting on the uh, bottom of the sea, and these are removed by a long cable called a sweep held between two minesweepers, which catches the mine cable and cuts it or pulls the mine loose from its mooring. Then there are the magnetic mines, which has to be dealt with by specially prepared electric sweeps, also towed by these small minesweeping vessels, and the crews of these ships have an extremely dangerous assignment, as you can well imagine. It's these little minesweepers, many of them fishing boats, trawlers, belonging to the British fishing fleet in time of peace, and many of them also American ships, have carried out their work with the utmost gallantry. Now here again is Bob Trout. That was Major George Fielding Elliott. And now here is our war correspondent, Quentin Reynolds, who has a few words for us about the guns that we took ashore on the northern coast of France. Here's Quentin Reynolds. Right now, there are millions of anxious mothers and fathers in this country living through the agony of uncertainty, visualizing what their sons went through during this past long, long night. Their hearts are sick with apprehension as they think of their boys there in the hostile beaches of France. It would be presumptuous for any of us to say to these parents, stop worrying. But perhaps I could give them some information which might make them feel better. You think of your son as a youngster who until recently was not trained to combat, was not born for killing. You shudder at the thought of him fighting against the great impersonal, frightening German war machine. But you forget that this is not only a battle of men, it is a battle of weapons. And today your son landed in France carrying the best weapons ever seen in battle. Earlier, Prime Minister Churchill spoke to the House of Commons. One sentence of his speech should bring a warm glow to the hearts of American parents whose sons are spearheading the invasion. Churchill chuckled and said, we have a great many surprises in store for the enemy. Undoubtedly, the Prime Minister was thinking of the new magnificent weapons which have been saved for this invasion. Weapons the like of which the world has never seen. I have seen these weapons in action in Sicily and Salerno, and I saw the newer ones tested at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds. And in every case, they are immeasurably better than the German counterpart. During the first stages of the landings, our men necessarily had to depend upon their lighter weapons. The little five-pound carbine, deadly at 300 yards. The magnificent M3 submachine gun a lethal weapon that only weighs eight pounds, but it can spray death more quickly than any German counterpart of it. The airborne troops mentioned so prominently in dispatches do not have to depend merely on the small arms they carry when they land. With them went our 75-millimeter pack howitzer, a gun that can be packed in six packages and dropped by parachute once our airborne troopers land. This tosses a heavy shell, and it tosses six of them a minute. By now, the big LSTs are landing our heavy mobile guns. I know you'll soon be hearing of our great 8-inch gun. I think this will be the pin-up gun of the invasion. This enormous weapon, the largest mobile gun in the world, weighs 35 tons, and it can fire one 250-pound shell per minute. It is so accurate that it can hit a target 20 miles away. I have seen this miracle gun do this at Aberdeen. The Germans have nothing to equal it, and it can be knocked down, loaded, and sent to another spot all in 40 minutes. I could go on and tell you of our big 240-millimeter howitzer that throws a 350-pound shell 25,000 yards, of our ever-reliable 105, 
of our great 120-millimeter anti-aircraft gun that can hit any German aircraft no matter how high it flies. A few weeks ago, Major General Charles T. Harris of our Ordnance Department told me bluntly and frankly, our weapons by every known test are the finest weapons in the world. No one can keep you from worrying about your son, but at least remember that the odds are in his favor. He didn't land in France last night armed with a slingshot or a bow and arrow. He landed carrying the best, most devastating weapons ever made. He's got the best there is. Give a prayer of thanks to our ordnance department, which designed and built these weapons. They will help bring your son back safely. Now I return you to Bob Trout. We've been listening to Columbia's war correspondent, Quentin Reynolds, here at Columbia's news headquarters in New York. Now, once again, we are going to pause for station identification. It will be a 30-second pause. But uh, I just want to take this opportunity, if you ladies and gentlemen of our audience will bear with us, I just want to take this opportunity again to assure our staffs at our affiliated stations throughout the country that we are continuing this broadcast of our invasion coverage. We are breaking for station identification for 30 seconds. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Columbia's news headquarters in New York again, Bob Trout speaking, and... Before we, well, we don't know whether we're going to go to London or not for another broadcast. Well, we, of course, we are going to take you to London frequently during the next hours and during the next days and, as Mr. Churchill says, weeks in which the invasion will be going on. But uh, it's difficult, as you know, if you've been with us through the night, it's difficult to foresee more than a couple of minutes ahead of time, sometimes a couple of seconds. So I won't promise anything about going to London. And instead, at the moment, I'd like to tell you that we're going to turn the microphone over now to Ned Calmer of CBS World News, who's familiar with that part of the French coast where we have landed and is, in fact, a former news correspondent of many years' experience in France. Mr. Calmer has been broadcasting to France recently in the French language for the Office of War Information and is heard regularly on the Columbia Network. Here's Ned Calmer. A feature, and perhaps a very vital feature, of these preliminary military operations is the French underground movement. On the strength or weakness of that movement may depend a good many American lives at this crucial hour, at this crucial stage of the invasion. We have as yet no reports on the extent of French underground activity. It's not likely, in fact, that we'll get any for some time. That's the kind of information General Eisenhower would hardly release at this time when it can prove of such value to the enemy. But there have been many indications of preparedness by the French resistance body. And their great opportunity, the chance they've been secretly prepared for all during the long and bitter German occupation, is now at hand. I'm going to speak to you for a few minutes on what we know of these preparations. You are aware, I know, that during the last few days before the invasion began, Allied headquarters gave very urgent and detailed instructions to the underground groups in France by radio, and probably by emissary as well, just as happened before we went into North Africa. Many a collaborator with the Germans, a supposed collaborator who's been hated by his own people, may have turned out this morning to be an Allied agent who's carried German favor to give him the opportunity to act now with the swiftness required by this supreme occasion. And our landings are reported taking place in an area where a well-informed and efficient underground information system can be of the greatest help to the Allies in the opening hours and days of the campaign. Information on passable roads, on the extent of damage to German installations, on the strength and location of hidden German defenses. The well-organized French underground has been expected to call a general strike when the Allied armies invaded the country. The purpose would be to paralyze transportation, electric power, and war production, and divert and confuse the German troops. The French underground is loosely divided between the active underground, the so-called Maquis, and the inactive underground. The Maquis is a well-organized, disciplined force comparable to Marshal Tito's Army of Liberation in Yugoslavia. It's said to number from 200,000 to 300,000 Frenchmen, including a good many former French soldiers. It's strongest in the Haute-Savoie region, far from the scene of our present action, 
but it spreads throughout all of France, and we have no exact idea as yet just how strong its operations have been during the past hours on the French coast of the English Channel. The tasks of the Maquis are assassination, sabotage of railways, power stations, canals, war plants, and armed resistance wherever and whenever feasible. The Maquis is so well organized that German attempts to penetrate it with spies and agents provocateurs have failed. Instead, it's the Nazis who have sometimes been caught and executed. The French Maquis also provides a law within a law in France, trying and executing those who have violated its own law as traitors to France. Both American and British agents are in active contact with the French Maquis. The British have supplied the Mackie with some arms by parachute and submarine. Within recent weeks, Army officials in Washington have sought to dispel the belief that the Mackie is a ragged, disorganized band. Instead, they say, the French Mackie, the underground, is a competent military force. The Germans in France have been well aware of these plans for a general strike on D-Day. They've tried unsuccessfully to force a strike call in order to reveal the leaders and plans of the Mackey. The latest attempt was a Vichy broadcast announcing that the names of all leaders had been revealed. The inactive underground in France is sympathetic with the Mackey and may be called upon to feed or supply them or assist in the smuggling out of allied aviators who have parachuted down into France. And now today, D-Day, the inactive underground is expected in large part to rally to the general strike call. Actually, the Germans do not directly control France, nor does the Vichy government. The Germans have forced upon Pétain an increasingly pro-Nazi government, including Joseph Darmont, France's Heinrich Himmler, who is Secretary General for the Maintenance of Order, Marcel Déa, the Vichy Minister of Labor and National Solidarity, and Jacques Doriot, the head of the pro-German Parti Populaire Français. Under this crew... Vichy police have been increasingly active in rounding up all persons suspected of underground activity. That was Ned Calmer, who's been speaking to us from Columbia's news headquarters here in New York. We have some reaction now from Moscow, which I'd like to pass along to you. Russians who learned of the invasion today, we are told in this dispatch, literally danced with glee. For them, it meant the end of three years of anxious waiting for the thrust from the West. Russian newspapers, which had not announced the landings, still were carrying glowing accounts of the fall of Rome. Peter Smollett, the head of the Russian Department of the British Ministry of Information, walked into the press department of the Foreign Commissariat in Moscow at 12.30 p.m., held up his thumb, and said, They're off. Then he went to notify Soviet officials. Major General John R. Dean, Chief of the United States Military Mission in Moscow, and L Lieutenant General, I should say Lieutenant General Burroughs, of British Military Mission Head, prepared a joint statement for the Soviet press. And that's all we have on the reaction from Moscow at the moment. Earlier we gave you the quotation from Ilya Ehrenberg, the famous Russian war correspondent. And now Alan Jackson has just come into Columbia's news headquarters here in New York with some more details on the extent of the Allied invasion armada. Here's Alan Jackson. When the Allies struck the enemy coast this morning, they struck with everything in hand, and that included a naval armada bigger than anything else that ever sailed the seven seas in all history. Thousands of ships took part, from big, hulking battleships to the homely little hybrid landing craft. Before the thousands of landing craft broke away from their protective convoys, the big guns of the warships opened up with an ear-shattering prelude of explosives. Ships of many navies took part in this early bombardment, but British warships spoke the loudest because there were more of them. This naval portion of the invasion, beggar's description, it is so huge. The eyes of John Paul Jones would have popped wide open at the untold hundreds of strange and wonderful craft spread out over the channel waters. It was an amazingly orderly confusion that saw the whole flat-bottomed Elsie family, as the landing boat species is referred to, chugging over the water with fighting men, guns, tanks, and all other bewildering baggage of combat. General Eisenhower's invasion broadcast to the people of Europe, which we brought to you. We brought you the voice of General Eisenhower in the small hours of the morning broadcasting to the people of Europe. That broadcast is considered to be a masterpiece. And now, here in Columbia's news headquarters, is Quentin Reynolds to analyze it for us. 
For months, the people of France, Holland, and Belgium had been waiting for the word that would tell them that we were on our way to restore to them the world of freedom they once knew. These heartbreaking months of expectation, of false rumors, of high hopes that never materialized, came to an end when General Eisenhower himself talked to them and told them that the hour had come. His broadcast to the people of the temporarily conquered countries contained only about 500 words. But those 500 words meant more to the people of Europe than the millions of words they have been forced to listen to from the voices of their temporary masters. Ever since the fall of France, they have been forced to listen to propaganda speeches, forced to read newspapers written by Nazi leaders. And then before dawn this morning, the calm voice of General Eisenhower electrified them and brought them new hope for the future. Eisenhower talked in English, but you didn't have to know our language to feel the deep sincerity, the calm confidence that his voice inspired. His talk was immediately translated into French, Flemish, German, and Norwegian. Eisenhower writes as he fights with direct, uncompromising forthrightness. His first sentence told the whole story when he said, A landing was made this morning on the coast of France, by troops of the Allied Expeditionary Force. This simple statement will be read by school children a hundred years from now. He told the people of Europe that America had not failed them. He went on to say that this landing is part of the concerted United Nations plan for the liberation of Europe, made in conjunction with our great Russian ally. And then he added, the hour of liberation is approaching. Then General Eisenhower revealed something which most of us thought and hoped to be true, but we never knew for sure. He revealed the fact that he has been in constant touch with the underground movements on the continent. He implied that when he said, follow the instructions you have received. Undoubtedly, he has been in touch with the underground leaders for a long time, and today they know what to do. Then General Eisenhower spoke specifically to the people of France. He said, Do not endanger your lives until I give you the signal to rise and strike the enemy. The day will come when I shall need your united strength. Until that day, I call upon you for the hard task of discipline and strength. He sounded a note of doom to the quislings of Europe when he said, and this sentence must have shriveled their craven hearts. Those who have common cause with the enemy will be removed. As France is liberated from her oppressors, you yourselves will choose your representatives and the government under which which you wish to live. This is in confirmation of the American policy and of not interfering with the domestic affairs of European countries. It is the United Nations pledge that the people who have suffered under the Nazi yoke will themselves decide the retribution, a pledge that they will once again enjoy the independence that they lost when the German invader came to their country. General Eisenhower's closing remarks will long be quoted. Today they are engraven in the hearts of millions of men who had almost lost hope. General Eisenhower said firmly and emphatically, I call upon all who love freedom to stand with us. Keep your faith staunch. Our arms are resolute. Together, we shall achieve final victory. I return you now to Bob Trout. That was Quentin Reynolds, Columbia's war correspondent, speaking of General Eisenhower's invasion broadcast to the people of Europe, one of the many broadcasts direct from London which we have brought you during the hour's of this long night. Now, of course, we are going to continue to bring you the invasion coverage from Columbia's news headquarters here in New York, but this particular broadcast is about to end. It's hard to realize, but it's been going on for seven hours, a continuous broadcast since three in the morning Eastern wartime. And now Columbia will resume its regularly scheduled programs, interrupting for news of extraordinary importance, of course. During the day, we hope to bring you the broadcast by King George VI, at 3 p.m. Eastern Wartime. 
and there'll be other special broadcasts from time to time. For authentic news of the invasion, stay tuned to your CBS station. This is Bob Trout speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.